to our schedule. I wanted to go ahead and uh, welcome everyone to this summer's ACRL Science and Technology Section's Government Information Update. Um, this year's topic is Evolving Access to Government Climate Data. Um, my name is Kara Watley. I'm the University Librarian at Caltech, and I am also co-chairing the Government Information Committee for STS this year. So I am delighted to be able to host um, our um, discussion today. Um, when the committee was looking at um, potential topics for the government information update, um, we discussed how researchers and librarians alike have experienced changes in the access to government climate data in recent years. And so we wanted um, to uh, have an opportunity for all of us to explore the evolving access to this data. And we're going to have three speakers today who are researchers researchers and librarians on the front lines of climate information. And they're going to be discussing available climate data resources, their work, and their thoughts on the future access to government climate data. The first of our speakers today is Katie Rowley, and she's the outreach librarian for the NOAA Central Library in Silver Spring, Maryland. She oversees the promotion of library services through web presence, email campaigns, information seminars, multimedia training, and one-on-one -on -one engagement with NOAA programs, offices, and leadership at all levels. Katie graduated from the University of, oh my goodness, I didn't practice saying this, Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland, with a master's in information and library studies, and she considers studying abroad to be one of her more brilliant decisions. So with that, I'll turn this over to Katie to kick us off. Thanks, Katie. Thank you so much, Kara, and you did pronounce it correctly. It is Strathclyde. Um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to join you today. Uh, I'm very excited to talk about NOAA's data. So hello everyone, I'm Katie Rowley, Outreach Librarian for the NOAA Central Library, which is one of 20 libraries in the NOAA network. We are spread out across the country. The NOAA Central Library is in Silver Spring, Maryland, uh, where the NOAA headquarters are. Let me see if I can move forward. Okay, first up, to understand NOAA, you really need to understand uh, our mission. So, to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and coasts, to share that knowledge and information with others, and to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystem and resources. So tucked under the Department of Commerce, NOAA was established by the President and Congress in 1970 under the Reorganization Plan Number 4 for better protection of life and property from natural hazards, for a better understanding of the total environment, and for exploration and development leading to the intelligent use of our marine resources. It became effective on October 3rd, 1970. And this is NOAA's data structure. Here's how it works, very, very simply put, I'll say. We have NOAA, and within NOAA is the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, or NESDIS. Uh, the government loves its acronyms. And within NESDIS is the National Center for Environmental Information, or NCEI. NCEI is the nation's leading authority for environmental data and manages one of the largest archives of atmospheric, coastal, geophysical, and oceanic research in the world. NCEI contributes to NESDIS's mission by developing new products and services that span the science disciplines and enable better data discovery. This means developing the ability to ingest, harmonize, and integrate environmental data and information collected from land, air, and ocean sensing platforms and in situ observations overall into usable products and to make these data accessible and shareable. For example, as part of the Ocean Archive System, NCEI man maintains the official archives for observational data collected by the Integrated Ocean Observing System, or IUS. 
This data access portal allows you to search the NCEI archives for individual data collections archived by each of the IUS regional associations and data assembly centers. So whole host of oceanic data there. Now, what about those world data centers and cooperative institutes? Here is a handy map that is going to show you that NCEI hosts world data centers and services as a member of the International Science Council World Data System, a collaborative effort to ensure universal, equitable access to environmental data around the world. NCEI hosts the World Data Center for Meteorology, Paleoclimatology, the World Data Service for Geophysics, and the World Data Center for Oceanography. NCEI also has a number of partner uh, such they're called uh, cooperative institutes within NOAA, and these are academic and nonprofit institutions throughout the country to conduct collaborative research, connect with scientific communities, and sponsor student fellowship. Science cannot be done alone. So currently, NOAA supports 17 cooperative institutes consisting of more than 57 universities and research institutions across 23 states and Washington, D.C., which you can see here on the map. Each of these are co-located uh, with NCEI locations. So what is collected? What do all of these various offices, organizations, what do they collect? It's a uh, comprehensive oceanic, atmospheric, and geophysical data. Environmental data are collected from many sources, as we saw from the organizational structure level. But these sources also include satellites, land-based stations, ocean buoys, ships, remotely operated underwater vehicles, weather balloons, radar, forecasting and climate models, and paleoclimatological research. So how do you access it? This is how. <laughs> You're going to navigate to ncei.noaa.gov. This web page is your launch pad for all the climate data collected by NOAA. There are a few caveats though. First, NOAA data may have a 60 day lag from the end of the data month for severe weather. So for example, if there was a hurricane yesterday, you would not be able to get that data that we collected from the hurricane until the end of the month plus 60 days. So that is how the data can be verified and ensured to be accurate as we have to go through a process doing that. Next, you want to go to the climate data, not the climate portal. So the climate portal is the image on your right, climate.gov. It's an excellent source, but it's not where you're going to find the downloadable data sets and information you're looking for. It is though an excellent resource for interpreted data and data narratives. As a librarian, this is the next crucial step in understanding where to point a user, breaking down a question. Most questions will be able to be broken down into two simple categories, weather elements like temperature, precipitation, wind speed, and, a, and then a time frame. So once you understand these two pieces of a question, you can find the appropriate NCEI product. And this is a list of the NCEI product categories of course, some products can be found in multiple categories. Okay, moving on. Now, how do you access it? An example. This is a question the library received recently, I believe this week. And it's something that we get fairly often. Hello, I'm a PhD research student currently studying the climatic effects in, on Iraq. And I wonder if you have the daily climatic data for the period 1981 to 2018 for daily temperature changes. Thanks for your help. Awesome. I can pass these folks on to ncei.info at noaa.gov. You can see that down along the bottom of the slide here. And this team behind this email account is, they're the real experts. They are amazing and super, super helpful to anyone who reaches out to them. But there are a few things you can do to uh, figure this out on your own. So first, identifying those weather elements or that data need, which here is the climatic data for the past for a past time period, which is 1981 to 2018. 
So I have a couple options for identifying the products I want to use. So I go to ncei.gov.noaa.gov, excuse me, under products, I'm gonna choose climate data online, then I'm gonna choose the search tool, and I'm gonna insert the, enter the necessary information. This is gonna bring up a specific data set to download. So I'm gonna show, this is what the online search looks like. It has a different uh, drop down for the weather type or observation or the data set you're looking for. So since I'm looking for daily temperature changes, I'm gonna look for daily summaries. I'm gonna have a date range from the beginning of 1981 to the end of 2018. I'm going to be searching specifically for a country, and then I'm going to enter Iraq. If I was going to look for something else, this can be broken down by zip code, by county, by state. It's a lot more detailed for the United States, but there is global information available as well. Now, if I don't want to use the products, especially the data, the climate data online uh, route, I can go to the NCEI map tool. This is a GIS tool. And when I use that, I select the World Meteorological Organization layer. So this is a layer you can click. And then you're gonna select the wrench tool, select location. I'm just gonna show my map so it makes more sense. So what you've got here is you've got the WMO tools. I wanna select a location, a drop down for a country. I'm gonna type in that country. It's going to zoom to a location and then it's going to say okay you can select all of these and it's going to give you this these details and I can add that to my cart so what does adding it to the cart mean what that means is that you have identified the data set that you would like so this image here featuring Asheville North Carolina is a period of record. This is what they're asking for. They're asking for daily summaries, location details. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna add this to your cart. We've all online shopped enough <laughs> to know that this option. Um, once you've added it to your, your cart, you select the cart. It's usually up in the upper right-hand corner. And then you're gonna see this next image. And the next image is gonna say, how do you want to download or access this material? What output format. Do you want this in a PDF, a CSV? Do you want it in a text file? And once you've done that, you continue, you review your order, you put in an email address, and they are going to email you the data set. Of course, many things can be tricky in these steps, but I would definitely offer up um, NCEI's uh, NCEI.orders or NCEI.info at NOAA.gov as an email with an amazingly helpful team behind them. Now, lastly, uh, I had this pretty, pretty quick. I can also dive into the website if anyone is interested, but this is a list of helpful links. I know these are going to be shared with everyone after the fact. Um, so these are some really helpful links for finding all of that NOAA data. I want to acknowledge the folks who helped me with this, Michael Brewer, Stuart Henson, and Andy Allegra, who have just been wonderful. And these are all of their emails as well, that you can reach out to them for more information on how all of this works. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you all for listening in. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Katie. And if it's all right with you, I'm going to ask um, for us to keep the questions until after all the panelists have spoken. Um, so for those of you who do have questions for Katie, I promise that I will give you um, her time for that at the end. Um, so Katie got us off to a very good start um, and um, I'd like to keep us going uh, by introducing Libby Carnahan. Libby Carnahan is the Florida Sea Grant agent for the University of Florida Extension for Pinellas County. She holds her climate change professional credential 
from the Association of Climate Change Officers, and she is founder and co-facilitator of the Tampa Bay Climate Science Advisory Panel, and it covers um, a seven county region. She's also an active leader and member of the Gulf of Mexico Climate and Resilience Community of Practice and is serving on the program committee for the 2022 National Adaptation Forum. Libby holds a uh, master's degree in marine science from the University of South Florida and a bachelor's in biology from Truman State University. And I'll turn it over to Libby. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are still muted, Libby. That helps. Can you tell me which view you have? Do you see the, um, the way you should, or do you see my view, the presenter view? I'm seeing the presenter view, so I can see the next slide as okay. well. So how do I stop this? Sorry, let me try and... Okay. Try. Apologize. That's okay. It happens all <laughs> the time. I'm not sure why it's kind of frozen right now. From the beginning. Might, um, do you want to um, to have me try sharing my screen since you sent me yours? Um, we could. Yeah, I was going to try maybe unshare and try. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Not really sure I had the presenter view. Let's try to stop share. Let's try and start again. Thank you everyone for your patience. We'll be there. I'm, just, I'm curious that this looks right like here. Let's try to sharing this one. That's perfect. It looks right to you? It looks right to me, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I don't have the same view you do. So hopefully um, I actually don't Are you able to share the one that you have? I don't have control over. Um... Yeah, let me um, let me give it a try. Ah, I can't share while you're sharing. Will you unshare okay, your? I'll share. Yeah. Okay. So, Does that okay. work for everybody? It does. I apologize, and I'll just fill in. I, I just added a couple little edits that I'll that I'll share. Okay. Well, I just ate up <laughs> a bunch of my time, um, but thank you very much, Kara, for the introduction. I appreciate it. As Kara said, I am a county sea grant agent in Pinellas County, Florida. Uh, we are the county that contains Clearwater and Saint Petersburg and we're on the west coast of Tampa Bay. Oh, sorry, next slide, thanks. Um, so a little bit just about Sea Grant. Um, sea Grant is part of NOAA that Katie just covered so well. Uh, so we are, however, uh, a multitude of state programs that are housed in all the coastal states, Guam, Great Lakes, Puerto Rico, and we are connecting folks with the research to make more informed decisions um, based um, in terms of their industry, like fisheries, like this gentleman, or working waterfronts. Uh, I work in climate change and sea level rise. So really connecting people with information and good data. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so a little bit about my climate involvement that was covered pretty well. Um, there's me as a little tyke, so I enjoyed 
the natural resources growing up with both of my parents, the mother as a biology teacher and a father as an avid outdoorsman. Uh, and here I am today. Next slide, please. All right. So um, one slide I, I had put in, but I've now taken out is uh, a slide that my colleague, uh, Maya Burke has shared uh, some of kind of Carl Sagan's advice for sorting through information and detecting if it's accurate. So she really kind of has like the baloney detector and that was my slide that I, that I took out. But um, basically, you know, you wanna look at your sources and your authors and really, um, really think about the information and where the people are coming from that are providing the information. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit more general, a little bit, um, I'm going to direct you to some resources, but not exactly um, data portals per se, as Katie did. So these are the summaries of the National Climate Assessment. Uh, the National Climate Assessment, um, we can go to the next slide, uh, is published every four to five years. It's mandated by the Global Change Research Act of 1990 that was initiated under George W. Bush, Republican uh, president, and then was signed into law under Democratic president, Bill Clinton. Uh, it says that a comprehensive report will be written to Congress and the president, as I said, every four to five years. So this, it, the way this works in the nuts and bolts is that different topical chapters are written by various uh, national agencies and then they inform the overall report that then, that then is written. So for example, NOAA writes uh, with partners, writes the sea level rise report that was written in 2017 and then inform the national climate assessment. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the national climate assessment writes, uh, this most recent one came out in 2018. I encourage you just Google, go to the website uh, it's the fourth national climate assessment. The website is very user friendly nowadays. Uh, it used to be kind of a big clunky report. And now I think it's, it's getting more and more slick. Uh, it's got 16 topical chapters on different sectors like those listed here and 10 regional reports that are based on geographic areas in the United States. So for example, in Florida, we fall into the Southeast United States report. Uh, and that gives you a little bit more of a view, those are like three to four page reports that tell you what the climate's been doing and what's expected to happen in, in the future. So I really recommend the National Climate Assessment as a go-to source uh, for an overall look at what's happening in the climate in the United States. Now next um, slide. I'm just gonna say a few different sources of information. So the National Weather Service is a great source of current information, uh, but they do also have archived data that they uh, could share with you and that is probably available. I'm sorry, I didn't fully listen to, to Katie's. I was mostly listening. Um, and so, so this might be available through the portal that she mentioned, but we can talk about that at the Q&A as well. So National Weather Service is of course part of NOAA. Okay, next slide. Uh, there's various other federal agencies that you can look to for information. I threw uh, a couple logos up there from my logo soup uh, file that I have in my computer. But the US EPA, uh, they had some great reports on health and climate change that were published in, I would say, January 2016. And I downloaded them promptly because uh, they did change their website with the new administration in 2016. And so some files were not as easily accessible. Uh, NOAA uh, also has, you know, we just heard a plethora of information that NOAA has. And the US Geological Survey is actively working on coastal resilience, coastal risk. Uh, they also have some portals where people can input their own information into, uh, into some of their, their apps and help record the current coastal condition. Next slide. Uh, each state should have a state climatologist. This is ours here, David Zierden. Uh, he's housed at Florida State University. So always consider them. Uh, they're, they're busy. Maybe not as busy as you would think, and they probably have time for you if you have a professional workshop with a professional audience or even engaged residents that really wanna talk about an issue. 
Uh, they have great experience in talking about these issues in plain language and are a great resource. Uh, so next slide. There's also different state agencies that have developed both around the topic of climate change, but also may have been in existence and are just working on these issues. So just a couple such in Florida, we have the Florida Climate Institute that's housed at University of Florida in Gainesville, uh, but they are a consortium of all the universities in the state of Florida and, and maybe a few agencies and really just bring together the researchers who are working on climate uh, to provide information and resources. They've recently written a comprehensive book on climate change in Florida that can be bought on Amazon or uh, through their website, I believe. You can also download each chapter and read them for free from their website. So look to your state. Your state uh, agencies are, are hard at work. And the next slide, uh, very similar as, um, what did I mess that up? There should be, yep, the universities. Um, so we've got, uh, you might be able to reach the universities through a consortium, like I just mentioned. Um, the Florida and Climate Water Alliance just had their 10th anniversary and they brought together water utilities experts and university experts on climate change and sea level rise projections together to talk about these important issues. So universities um, are also, you know, I'm, I am part of UF IFAS extension. In addition to Florida Sea Grant, not every Sea Grant program is part of a land grant program, but ours is, and it's a great benefit to us. It's additional resources. Uh, so, the universities are really looking to kind of get in the game more. Uh, they're, they're all, it seems to be looking at the extension model, I like to say, um, because they are looking at more actionable science that can be delivered on the ground versus you know, science on the shelf. Uh, so the next slide. Uh, so we have, um, in terms of looking for, for data, uh, this is just an example of a data that is collected by national agency, NOAA, but is from a local source. So this is the data that comes from the St. Petersburg tide gauge here. You can go to NOAA tides and currents and see, uh, pick your tide gauge that's the closest to you in the coastal area. Uh, if you wanna know what the water level is doing at the time, you can click on the water levels tab and then choose water levels. And then you'll get uh, a tide with the actual current water level projected on top of that. And that's great during storm season uh, if there's hurricanes to look and um, you know you can't do much more than see what the water is doing but um, it's, it's good to it's good to know uh, for us scientists we like to monitor the storms um, so tide gauges are have been scattered around the globe since the late 1800s and they are part of coordinated efforts uh, the folks that have tide gauges at the national and the global level talk to each other uh, and this actually, just so you know, this uh, curve came out of, or well, this came straight from NOAA tides and currents, I will say. I'll go, if we go to the next slide. Uh, so you can take that measured data and then through the, uh, sorry, through the Army Corps of Engineers online calculator, we got our projections that are localized to the St. Petersburg region. Um, so these are NOAA curves based on our local tide gauge. And I put local advisory groups here because that is another great resource for you. A lot of these climate efforts have evolved at a very local or small regional scale because we've had a void of uh, federal leadership for some time. And in our case in Florida, we've uh, had a lacking of state leadership. So in that void, uh, you know, I formed the Climate Science Advisory Panel in 2014 to make this sea level rise recommendation to our local government. And since then, the elected officials have come together and formed a member of understanding and a resiliency coalition in the Tampa Bay region. Um, so look to your groups, look to your region of planning councils, uh, see what folks are doing, ask questions, ask what science they're using, um, you know, ask questions. So next slide. Peer reviewed publications are of course a very, good place to look. Uh, sometimes it can be kind of heavy science and a little bit hard to follow the new cutting edge research. So your university professors can help with that. This is just an example of a paper that came out after the NOAA 2017 recommendation uh, that actually then shows that the satellite gauges, or I'm sorry, the satellite altimetry has shown a clear acceleration in sea level rise. 
So this is an update for our CSAP recommendation. We took out the NOAA historic low projection, which was a linear projection. Um, and so this shows just that the science is always evolving. We're always getting new information. It's important to know how to talk about science and that it doesn't mean that we were quite wrong per se. It's the evolution of science, the evolution of knowledge. Uh, we're just gonna keep learning and it doesn't mean we were lying before as people might say, or trying to flub the data. Um, so we go to the next slide. Uh, this is just an example to show you that uh, agencies that we work with are paying attention to communication and how it is important. So the National Hurricane Center has added a storm surge forecast in 2017 that they did not have previously uh, because of you know, Katrina and other storms where the surge was the problem and people did not maybe heed the other warning messages. So just adjusting the messaging, seeing what works, doing focus groups, um, it, this is being done. And so, you know, it might seem like government moves at a snail's pace, but, but they, are, they are trying to improve. Uh, so next slide. Just another slide of ongoing, understand that research is ongoing, as I was just saying, you know, try and um, understand that we know the basic ideas, but we're, we're bringing more of the nuts and bolts in, and that might change projections as we get more information, for example, like about ice melt, which is a very, um, there's not as much understood about the ice melt, it's happening very quickly, and there's a lot of hydrodynamic processes that are happening out of sight. So it's very, very complex and will continue to evolve. And that's important that people understand that. Next slide. Um, just a little slide I kept in here from uh, one of my other presentations to remind you that um, people are responding, they're building resilience, they're reducing risks. Uh, I think the word that totally I always think about is innovation. You know, we have, we now know we can't plan for the future based on the past. That's how we used to plan. Um, so we need to make adjustments, but that's exciting. We can plan for a better future. We can think about new ways to engineer and design and build and, and just try and make things better. So I have a couple more slide, a few more slides. Um, let's kind of skip this one really quick. That one just basically says that no matter what we do, <laughs> that we are kind of tied into a certain amount of climate change and sea level rise, which is, is unfortunate, but uh, it's the case we're at and it's not a reason not to act, um, but it's just knowing that we're acting towards a changing climate. This document I love. Uh, it's probably about 10 years old and I go back to it all the time. It's from uh, Columbia in the CRED school. It's the psychology of climate change. So I'll go through these really quick. Um, so you do want to know your audience. Uh, that means that, you know, I would uh, generally like to know if I'm speaking to professionals or if I'm speaking to a lay audience. Am I speaking to homeowners on the beach who are concerned that sand dunes that, you know, we think protect coastal resiliency are blocking their view of the ocean, you know? So really, you know, different audiences you could cater your message. It doesn't mean that you're lying or tricking. It's just, it's just what we've done our whole lives as communicators. Uh, get your audience's attention. So, you know, find something that relates to them that's important. Think about maybe a key uh, location or a place of interest that everyone in the community cares about. Translating the scientific data into concrete examples. So if instead of that sea level rise graph, if I could show an image of one of these places of interest with water that's up in the entrance way, that might uh, have resonate a little bit better. But then we go to number four, beware of, use, of the overuse of the emotional appeal. So, you know, we don't have polar bears in Florida, so I don't put polar bears in my slideshows. I do think it's very important. It's very sad that they're losing their habitat, um, but I think keeping it concrete, as we said before, and, and not so much the emotional appeals. Uh, addressing the scientific and climate uncertainty is a challenge. You know, once we say uncertain, sounds like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about then. No, no, it's the degree of error. That means it could be within this range. Um, you know, so just really kind of thinking about how to address those uncertainties. When I talk about sea level rise, I usually say that we know this sea level rise is going to happen. What we don't know is when. Um, so we're not sure of the rate, but it's still something we need to prepare for 100%. Uh, and tap into their social identities, encourage group participation. 
Uh, people are a lot more likely to do something if they um, have an accountability partner or pledge to a neighbor that they're gonna do it also. Uh, and make behavior change easy. Make sure to let people know. Um, and I'm gonna just tell you, you know, just a few small examples. EPA has a great website for how you can prepare your home, your office, your transportation methods to better align with, with uh, sustainability. So we could go to the next slide. Um, and this document's available online for download for free. So if you just Google CRED, Climate Communication. So I encourage everyone to seek and share information. Um, you know, to, ooh, we got some thunder. Uh, talk with your neighbors and friends. Uh, encourage you to look up more information, like all those data sources that Katie shared. Um, and I do apologize, I don't, um, I don't know the audience that much today because we didn't um, we didn't share that. So I'm not trying to talk down to anyone if some of this is, is repeat for y'all um, as professionals, but um, really, you know, look to your, every, uh, every state has extension, even if anyone on here is not in a coastal state. Uh, so I encourage you to look to your university land grant system um, for, for local programs and local information. We do have a national extension climate initiative that all of our higher up leaders are very, uh, very keen on, on us sharing climate information. Uh, next slide. Just different ways to get involved. Uh, why not? I put the first uh, option as run for office. You know, uh, a lot of people are running for office these days that never really thought about it. And why, why not you? Why, why someone else and not you? Uh, there's also lots of boards at the city and county level looking for public as well as professional participation. Um, you all, everyone is an expert. Everyone knows something that other people don't know. You know, you know what's happening on your house. You know what's happening in your neighborhood. Um, you see things. Um, and so you are an expert, no matter what. Uh, and there's a lot of other ways to get involved and uh, writing elected officials. Obviously, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And um, my last slide, I believe, just has my contact information. Uh, I just added the TikTok. I think I just have it as Pinellas C Grant. I only have one video, uh, but I talked to two high school groups two weeks ago. And when they saw this slide, they said I had to be on TikTok and I'm trying to be responsive. And so, all right, I'm gonna try and be on TikTok and entertain my youth audience. And that is the end. And thank you very much. Sorry if I went too long. Um, thank you, Kara, much for handling that, the tech. <laughs> No problem. Thank you so much for um, for talking with us today. Now I have to um, now I have to get myself out of um, your slides. So um, I'm going to move us on to um, our third and final speaker, Alejandro Paz. Alejandro is a website monitoring analyst at the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative, which documents and analyzes environmental governance issues. He holds a master's degree in library and information science from Simmons University and a BA in English. After graduating from Simmons, Alejandro began working at the Union of Concerned Scientists as a gift and data processing associate. And in the summer of 2020, Alejandro also worked as a contractor for the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative, creating database of important environmental related US government websites, now known as the Federal Environmental Web Tracker. As a recent graduate of information, uh, a recently graduated information professional. Um, he's currently pursuing career opportunities in research and access services, knowledge management, and information governance. Alejandro? Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. So thank you, Kara, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so before I start, I'll just quickly say that I am looking for, for to work in an academic library. So if any of you have leads, please send them over. So let's begin. This presentation will be about the web resources that contextualize and provide access to federal climate data. But first, I would like to give a little bit of background information about EDGY and what we do. So we are a network of academics and nonprofit grassroots organizations that work in collaboration with other groups concerned about climate change, science policy, good governance, and data justice. AG was founded in response to the election of Donald Trump in November 2016 to document, analyze, and publicize 
uh, how environmental governance would change under that administration. We continue our work today, pressing for improvements and assessing progress by the Biden administration. One of our core functions is to raise awareness about access to information in government climate websites and how this access might affect users, such as researchers, librarians, and the general public, who all depend on the web infrastructure that contextualizes and leads us to climate data. In this presentation, I will cover why we monitor federal websites, what we've observed on federal climate websites, our thoughts on access to government climate data, and uh, a few specific recommendations for web resources. So websites are generally the first and most frequent point of contact between agencies and the public. The Office of Management and Budget recognizes that they are the primary means by which the public receives information from and interacts with the federal government. Informing people is important to agencies. Uh, EPA says they teach people about the environment as one of the six things they do to accomplish their mission of protecting human health and the environment. The public relies on agencies to synthesize, interpret, and summarize information, and thus agencies control both the presentation of and access to information. Most users are not trying to access climate data itself. They usually access synthesized interpretations of data provided by agencies. This information is vulnerable because of the laws and regulations governing what agencies have to provide on their websites are not always clear or easily enforced. It is also vulnerable to political persuasion as, as those agencies are led and shaped by political appointees. EGI has published several reports covered by news outlets concerning changes to federal websites. This news coverage indicates there is real public concern about access to federal climate information on uh, the government web. Our recommendations in these reports are to make access to climate data and information less vulnerable and an avenue for trust building between agencies and the public. So how does EGI and its website monitoring team monitor federal environmental information? So first, the Internet Archive downloads uh, nearly 30,000 web pages across 13 federal agencies for us every day. We developed custom software that compares the latest version of a web page with the previous version and identifies differences between those two pages. Our software processes all the pages where there were differences and creates a weekly output spreadsheet that includes metadata for each change, such as the amount of HTML source code that changed in a web page. Our team of analysts manually check these changes by viewing them in our custom user interface, which looks like the bottom part of the screen right here. Anything that's been deleted shows up highlighted in red on the left-hand side, and anything that's been added is green on the right-hand side. We categorize significant findings using a set of custom elements. Among others, these include the type of change or whether a change represents an increase or decrease in access to information. Another would be the topic of a change, such as, let's say, oil and gas or agriculture, just to name a few examples. EGI also created the Federal Environmental Web Tracker in order to maintain a public record of changes made to environment-related federal government web pages of broad interest. It is a data set of our analysts' findings during the Trump administration, and it can be accessed through our website. So let's go over some of the things we've seen. Among great public resources provided by our federal government are the climate information from the NASA and the NOAA websites. There's EPA's Climate Indicators website, which is shown here. It's easy to navigate and leads to a wide variety of different kinds of indicators. It has graphics for various indicators. It has citations throughout, which is unfortunately fairly rare on government websites. And this layout provides an easy gateway to climate data itself. Now, this is not always the case. Many web pages only have two to three sentence summaries and uh, let's say links to thousand page plus documents with no intermediate doc information. So another good example would be the Clean Power Plan website. Uh, this is a, a website with over 85 pages. It includes contextual information about the environmental issue and the regulatory landscape, including sections on existing policies and programs for reducing CO2 emissions and tools for estimating the impacts of renewable energy on those emissions. There is also access to government financial projections and tools with which businesses uh, can better understand and use their own data. 
but some of the most useful resources during the Trump administration fell victim to political persuasion, or in some cases, outright removal. The EPA climate change website was famously compromised. First, with this remarkable splash page explaining that the website is being updated to reflect the priorities of President Trump and then Administrator Pruitt. It was removed in its, in its entirety 18 months later. Some other agencies' climate change web pages were also removed, such as the Department of Interior website. EPA's Climate Indicators website, which I covered recently just now, uh, itself wasn't updated for four years during, of course, the uh, Trump administration. And along with EPA's climate change website being removed from public access, in uh, April 2017, the entire 85-page plus Clean Power Plan website redirected to a single energy independence webpage uh, about an executive order uh, made by President Trump. In addition to outright removals, we observed more subtle changes as well, language changes that altered or the meaning or interpretation of web content or navigation changes that made resources more difficult to find. So in this slide, you can see some of the examples that we discovered over the years. So how might all of this affect, let's say, the students or researchers that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis? So in, first of all, individuals can search for and discover government climate data from a number of starting points, such as library research guides or government websites. One way or another, students and researchers looking for this climate data will need will likely need to interact with government websites, regardless of their research. Most are likely not such experts as to be able to find and use government data without needing government websites to guide them to it and to contextualize that data. In addition, researchers working with climate data will often need to understand the regulatory background behind, behind how the government produces, maintains, and makes decisions on uh, this data. So how they encounter that information also affects their work. And on the slide, you can see an example of important information uh, that was removed uh, regarding uh, the global climate change and the, and the National Environmental Policy Act. So what else is there? Uh, yes, research guides such as the one above in the slide from Georgetown University are useful launching points for individuals who already have a basic understand understanding of science topics. On the other hand, government websites will more often present educational information geared towards the public at large. The patrons of research libraries might be less influenced by the way climate data is framed and contextualized in government websites, such as the one in the slide, at least compared to the average site visitor. However, the removal of scientific information or politically motivated alterations of language could still potentially affect how researchers search for or encounter climate data. For example, during the Trump administration, we saw the term climate change removed from several web pages. We also saw other terms such as greenhouse gases replaced or removed. The effect of these changes is difficult to quantify, but researchers using search engines to look for websites that link to climate data might have been affected. On a further note, we would like to point out that resources like data.gov might be great for expert users or librarians, but not so useful for those who don't know what data they are looking for already. The content that frames climate data, this includes website architecture, uh, information graphics, summaries, and so on, affects access to that data, which is not the same as data simply being available on the web, through resources like this one. So that's an important distinction. So we know that wholesale removals of information would affect students and researchers' ability to both find information they're specifically looking for and to make connections between information they already know and information that is new to them. The timing of removals can also have drastic effects on civic engagement, however. A particularly concerning pattern we observed during the Trump administration was the removal of key information during active regulatory processes, usually weeks to months in advance of public comment periods, as is shown on this timeline. These sorts of targeted removals 
clearly impact the public's ability to participate in the democratic process built into environmental decision-making. This situation underscores the need for regulations mandating the preservation of federal web-based information. We also need to not merely focus on preserving resources to make sure they're available, but also improving the resources to make sure information is also accessible and useful. Federal websites could be easily freely accessed vehicles to build student and adult scientific and environmental literacy. As you all know, and we've mentioned before, many web resources simply have only two sentence summaries, often with a link to several hundred page documents for further information. Uh, this type of arrangement is both too little and too much for most people. And importantly, it doesn't provide any steps to include someone's knowledge of an issue or understanding how a policy might relate to an issue. We can and should build resources that make these connections and make these steps accessible. Resources such as EPA's Climate Indicators website do a good job of providing ladders of increasingly complex information to users. This image uses screenshots from the Obama era Clean Water Rule website, for example, which is another uh, you know, great example of proper web governance. In addition to making information available and accessible, we also need to ensure that public data is accessible and packaged in relevant and useful ways. EDGY's Environmental Enforcement Watch is another project that covers these issues. It specifically focuses on environmental enforcement data. The EEW program made a mirror of EPA's enforcement and compliance history online database, also known as the ECHO database, and created uh, browser-based tools to allow laypersons to query the database and aggregate findings. The EEW team has synthesized information from EPA data, social, historical, and political contexts, and community knowledge to generate useful reports on producing better government data portals. After observing drastic changes in the last four years and longstanding issues affecting web resources, we recommend that care and regulations be taken to ensure that resources are available, accessible, and useful for intended audiences. So here you can see some of our recommendations. Now, with regards to access to government climate data, the most important of these, in my opinion, is making sure websites contain information adjacent to climate data that would make it easier to find and understand. Hence, we use the terms uh, ladders of information to describe this idea. So uh, yeah, I hope you, know, you find these recommendations uh, thought provoking and uh, so this is the end of our presentation, and uh, I'm just going to leave you here in the last slide with my contact information. So, Kara, is that good? That's great. Thank you very much. I'm I'm sorry if we've cut you a little bit short. I just want to make sure that um, everyone has a chance to ask you and Libby and Katie any questions that they might have. So you can um, you can put your questions in the chat. One of the oh, things that so I, <laughs> there you go, great. Well, I was just going to ask Alejandro. Um, I wasn't, you know. Once again, listening about 90%. Um, but did you say that most of these sites have been restored now under the current administration? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, so the, the EPA climate change site has been restored and uh, we've seen several updates in the last few months. Um, other sites have interestingly enough not, not, not been restored. So the DOI climate change website, last time I checked is still not available, it, but, um, you know, we'll have to see later on if they do restore that and how they do it. Um, pretty much all the like the climate indicators website that has been updated now after four years of silence. So it, 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 there have been some good updates there. And I mean, I, I could give more examples, but some of them are really going into the weeds. Like I believe in the NIH uh, subdomain, there were a few uh, websites with climate change language that had been sort of 
not scrubbed up information, but had the term climate change been like altered to just say changes in climate as opposed to climate change and stuff like that. But that has been you know restored. And yeah, if you if you follow Edgy on Twitter, I think you can you will update the public from time to time on different restorations that we've seen. So how are you all continuing to monitor the federal sites? Yeah, we're, we're still, uh, what we do is we basically every week we meet together and we have, um, all of our analysts have like a portfolio of domains that we watch. And so the way our, our software works is that if a site is changed in a way that would make us think that there might be something important there. Like if the term, uh, say the term mercury is added several times to a web page on the EPA domain, that will automatically uh, show up in a spreadsheet that is generated from information that we get from the internet archive that we process through our, our software. And so we kind of get that in a kind of spreadsheet format and we look at it and we talk about it. We analyze it using like a, a tool that creates like a difference, a differential view of an older and newer version of the web page. And then we that culminates into reports, tweets, blog posts from us, and, and so on. And so we're still doing that in the Biden administration. Um, yeah, we hope to soon actually release more reports. So we've got a question in the chat about will we be sharing um, the slides from the presenters? Yes, we will. Um, so the science and technology sections, government information committee will be compiling um, the recording, the slides, and then um, our notes document to, to share out with all of the attendees and all of the section members. I have a question for Katie. So in your presentation, you gave um, an example of a researcher question that came in recently, and you said it was sort of a, a typical kind of thing. Um, as an academic librarian, I am um, also, you know, used to getting those kinds of questions that come in. And it's interesting to me that our researchers will, will go directly to, to NOAA for it, but it makes it makes plenty of sense. How often are your um, are your researchers, um, you know, folks from outside of NOAA reaching out to the librarians there and asking questions? Um, I would say the majority of the questions the library gets through our reference account are outside of NOAA. So folks who want information on data, especially, especially if they um, are from another another country, uh, an academic institution, the library seems to be the first place that they, they go. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get those type of questions that say like, oh, I mean, most of it's public also. So there are questions like, hey, I was in, you know, New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. What was the highest like flood stage level? And I'm like, Okay, cool. And so you, you know, there, there are tools for that, but then there's, you know, stuff that I don't even know. So we pass it on to the, you know, NCEI, so the National Center for Environmental Information, and let them have a crack at those type of questions. But yeah, majority of what comes into the library is from outside of NOAA. And Libby, we were introduced to you because you actually have um, collaborated with some of the librarians um, in the universities in Florida. So how often do you usually work with information professionals? Um, probably not as often as I should. <laughs> uh, I always feel like, you know, we kind of struggle to find the time, um, you know, when you're teaching and doing outreach to, get the information and just stay regularly up to date on the science. Um, so I will say I am subscribed to a lot of these newsletters like NOAA, NASA has a climate newsletter, you know, and so those are great sources of information. Also, uh, you know, but but I would say not not that much, but um, but you know, I do have UF there and, and I consider that a great resource. Um, I'm often logging in to uh, to go get a primary research article and so on. But um, yeah, what I was, what, what, what you mentioned is I did take part in 2017 and what was kind of a pilot program, uh, it was a NOAA climate change book club. So it was with a NOAA grant and yeah, I was with Kayla Cooney who was in um, 
Newport Ritchie at the time. And so she had volunteered and then they matched up kind of librarians that were close. So it was a different county for me, but it was it was great. And it was right, um, it was actually the, the fall when we had Irma. So we literally had a book club two days before, like we all thought we were expecting to get hammered. And uh, luckily she took kind of a turn to the East earlier. Otherwise, some of those folks I talked to, you know, knowing their risk, they would have really suffered. Um, so it was a great way to, to use books as a way to work with the public. And I'm reading some other climate books now, and I think I want to do some more, more climate change book club. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for also mentioning Kayla Cooney, who um, is with Sustain RT, who um, we partnered with um, in the planning of um, this event. So I'd like to give a shout out to Kayla and Sustain RT and the STS Government Information Committee for um, the work that went into the back end of this. Thanks also um, to Gina and Alois at ACRL for, um, for managing all of the details of this presentation. Special thanks to Katie and Libby and Alejandro for joining us today. Thank you very much um, for the time that you took to talk to us. It was really, really useful. And with that, I'll sign us off. Have a great afternoon, everyone.